called uh, rotations in a room. So basically we're going to go over some basic camera rotations and we're also going to show how to create a simple little first person shooter room, what exactly it takes to be able to walk around in that, um, you know, just kind of showing off some stuff. So to give you a quick example of what this is going to look like in the end, here is a quick sample. Um, you can see that we've got this little quad in the center that's the same as what we made before. We've also got this nice little room around it. You'll notice I'm rotating, um, hard to kind of see right here, but I am actually uh, rotating with the mouse. Um, so that's another big benefit is we'll be showing how to how to hook up your mouse and get that working. Um, and the cursor, you can actually see it move slightly off to the side when I move the mouse fast enough, but that's actually um, stuck in the center of the window. Um, so that's another nice benefit is how do you actually go through and do that. Um, we're going to kind of do it to hack together today, but uh, we'll show more of that in the future. And then of course we have the movement which is uh, based on where you're looking rather than just moving only forwards and backwards. Um, you'll notice that we're also stuck to the ground, so if I look up and I move forward we're not flying up into the sky. Um, that's a pretty simple change you can do, but I really want to focus on making something that's actually playable. So we're going to just solely focus on uh, basic movements only in the X and uh, in the Y directions. Um, and you'll see more of uh, X and Z directions, technically. So you'll see more of that as we go through and we talk about it in this video. Um, but this is kind of the, the, the what it's going to look like in the end. So let me just go ahead. Oh, boy. People commenting, just stuff. Um, so this is the, uh, there we go, okay. So there is the uh, basics of what it's going to look like. So we're going to be taking, this was our original demo from last time. If you guys remember, you'll notice the mouse is not stuck. We can only move left, right, uh, forward, back, left, and right. Um, and the end result, again, just to show it, it's going to look something like this where we have a full room and we can walk around and we can see all sides of this and everything. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. All right. See ya. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go through and uh, this this uh, current shape so we have right here, this is actually an okay shape to test with, so we're not going to worry about the room quite yet. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and get the mouse rotations in. So you'll remember last time we worked on this that with our camera object we actually had uh, two methods for rotation. We had a set rotation and a rotate method. So set rotation sets what the actual rotation is currently and then rotate actually increments the rotation. So um, we can say we're going to rotate it to zero so it's going to be facing you know the default direction and when we say rotate uh, 45 it's going to rotate to 45 degrees and if we call rotate 45 again it'll then rotate to 90 because it's adding the 45s together. So that's the idea of rotate and set rotation would be if we say set rotation to 45 on the y-axis and rotate 45 degrees. If we call that again, it's still going to be at 45. It's not incrementing it, it's setting it. Same thing if it started at 90 and we say set rotation 45, it's then going to set it to 45. This is very important. I know it seems kind of silly to go over it like this, but it's very important for what we're going to be going over next, which is how to actually rotate the camera. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is probably something you may have already tried, um, but it's uh, part of how you can do this which is, um, we can go ahead and we can say if state SDL scan code uh, left, so if we press the left arrow key, then what we can in theory do, because we have that rotate method, is we can just do rotate, uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll say, uh, so if we're going to the left, that's a negative rotation, so we'll say negative one, on the x-axis, nothing, on the y-axis, one, and on the z-axis, uh, zero as well. So the, what that basically says is that all of our rotation is going to our y-axis. This is kind of based around what quaternions work, which is you basically give the axis the direction that you want to rotate around, and then it rotates around that point. Um, this is pretty key. Um, is this is how most 3D uh, rotations work. Um, and we're going to be kind of doing it differently. I want to make sure this is easy to understand how you can do so. So we're going to kind of do a weird mixture of Euler angles and quaternions. So if you don't know what quaternions are, um, basically Euler angles are you have a rotation on the Y, X, and Z axis. Um, so if I take, for example, uh, if I go ahead and I take this pen right here, uh, I'm trying to find a pen with no markings on it. 
So if I go ahead and I take um, these tweezers, okay? I'm just going to take a pair of tweezers here. I don't know why they're here. But we take these tweezers, okay? And we say, ah, it's too small. I really want something bigger that we can actually do this with. Ah, how about a pillow? That would work, right? right? There's nothing wrong with a pillow. Um, okay, so we have this pillow, okay? We want to rotate this pillow along the x-axis. So it's pronounced Euler is what I'm being told. I don't know if that's right. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, just not worry about it too much. Basically, there's multiple types of different, oh, I hate this IRC application for the way it works. Yes, I get it. I have a message, a notification. Stop forcing me to look at that window. OK, there we go. OK, so we have our rotation. The way that this works is, let me make sure that I can see everybody's chat messages. I don't think there's been any questions yet. So uh, let's go ahead and explain this. OK, so rotations. This is a very, very complex subject. Um, it's not something that's easy to go over, so we're going to take it in strides. So first part. Euler or Euler, um, I'm not sure on the correct pronunciation, I don't pronounce it very often, but basically you have the X rotation, the Y rotation, and the Z rotation. The, uh, let me make sure I get this right, pitch, yaw, and roll. Okay, so the pitch is the X axis, the yaw is the Y axis, and the roll is the Z axis. So the way to think about it, pitch is X. So this is our X axis. My arm is along the X axis. So when we rotate, we're rotating like we're pitching a baseball. Okay, so the pillow will rotate around my arm in that direction. Okay, so then we have a yaw or the y-axis. So the way to think about this is you're rotating around in this manner. You're rotating around the y-axis. Okay, so that is a yaw rotation on the y-axis. Okay, the z rotation is a roll. So the z-axis is coming straight at you, and so this the pillow will rotate in this manner. Okay. So this is how the rotations work. So you have yaw, pitch, and roll. Um, and that's the general way, the easiest way to think about uh, rotations and such with uh, these programs. So uh, that's the first way, OK? Now, there are limitations with this. The problem with those is that when you try and apply them together, you get what's called a gimbal lock. And I'm not really going to go over this. Um, it, it's complex to explain. Wikipedia generally, I think, has a uh, good image on it. Let me make sure on this real quick. So here it is. So this is a good example image. So um, you'll notice that this is what it looks like when you're rotating with the uh, pitch and roll. Now the problem you run into is that there's what's called a gimbal lock. A gimbal lock is basically like this. The gimbal lock occurs at this position right here where you try and rotate them all together because when you try and do that it, it just doesn't work out right. Um, and this is caused by the way that those rotations work. So the solution to this is that we need a new system for how to rotate objects and so this has led into what is called quaternions. Um, whole fascinating thing on this. Um, there's a really good video that I'm going to go ahead and bring up to point you guys to. Um, let me go ahead and find that real quick again. And this is a great video to kind of go over the basics of it. Um, it's a pretty simplistic way to look at it as well. Um, history. Make sure I find that right video. Here we are. Um, I highly recommend this video. Uh, shout out to Numberphile. They are an awesome channel in and of themselves. Highly recommend them. I'll post this in the link below. They give a quick and good uh, basic overview of quaternions and kind of talking about them. But the basic way to think about them, very, very basic, do not take this verbatim. But the basic way to think about it is that rather than rotating based on the different axes individually, you choose an axis that you want to rotate along and you apply an amount of rotation per axis. Okay, so for example, with our pillow again. Let's say that we want to rotate so that we have this rotation, so we have a 90, uh, 90 degree rotation on the x-axis and then a uh, and then a 90 degree axis rotation afterwards on the z-axis. Okay, so that brings our pillow like this where it's got 
gotten like this, okay? So the way that we could do that with the, uh, rotate, with the normal rotations is we first apply our uh, X rotation, sorry, we want to first apply our Z rotation and then rotate like this, okay? And you could also do it like this and this, okay? So there's a certain order to those rotations. And that's the biggest problem that comes in with these as well. So the way that we can do it without that is we say we want to rotate along really this kind of diagonal angle by 90 degrees. And so what that does is it looks something like this. Um, basically, you have to choose an axis you want to rotate along, and then you tell how much to rotate by um, is the basic idea. So that's how OpenGL works, and that's why if you look at our actual, the reason I'm explaining all this, I know it's a lot to go over and such, but if you actually look at the rotations here, um, you'll notice there's four properties. We have the rotation angle, we have the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis. So remember I said that when we're rotating the camera left, we want to be turning the player so that they look to the left, or I guess if I'm on camera, if I'm flipped, it'd be that way, yada, yada, yada. So what we really want to say is we want to, on the y-axis, we want to rotate, okay, if my hand is the player, okay, we want to rotate on the y-axis, we want to rotate 90 degrees, we want to rotate a little bit to the left. Basically, when the player turns, we're rotating along the y-axis to the left. So naturally, um, on the right side, we're going to do the opposite in that we're going to rotate along to the right side. So we're going to go the opposite way, and that'll give us that rotation. So if we go ahead and we run this up, um, now that we've got it set to the arrow keys, we go ahead and do this, and uh, actually, whoops, did it the wrong way, backwards. Because remember, uh, from our last series of videos, um, the rotations are going to be flipped because of the fact that we're inversing everything from the world. Um, because our camera is, the world is moving while the camera is staying in position. So now if we do this, um, you can see that our rotations and stuff are all correct. Now our positions are incorrect because we are applying them separately. Um, basically we're moving forward and back. The X and the Z directions never change. It's the world around the player changing. And so when I rotate, but then I move forward, I'm still moving forward relative to the world whereas when I wrote my view of the world is what's changed okay so this is a very important thing because we actually have to mathematically say okay now that I'm looking to the right we really want to move along the x-axis not the z but we'll get into that in a sec the big thing to notice is that uh, we have to do the rotations in that manner where they're kind of inversed from each other so that's our left right up left and right and that's pretty straightforward what about up and down okay so if we go ahead and we do our up rotation and our down rotation Okay, same type of deal. We want up to actually be in the positive direction. Okay, and what this is going to do is this is going to uh, make it. Whoops, let me find this real quick and just verify one thing. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be inverse. So again, uh, up is going to be positive now, right? Right? Yes. Up is going to be positive, even though it's technically negative, and down is going to be negative, even though it's technically positive because we're doing it reverse the world. The big difference is now, instead of rotating along that y-axis, we're going to rotate along the x-axis because we're looking up and down. We're giving it a pitch, okay? So we go ahead and we do that. Um, and again, this is based on quaternions, though, so it's a little bit different. So we go ahead and we do this, and if we go ahead and we apply this now, when we look up and down, we've got it all correct, okay? Now, this is where things get very, very tricky. Remember how I said that we are applying these rotations based on, we're applying these rotations uh, on top of each other. So if we say rotate 45 degrees to the right on the y-axis, then we rotate 45 degrees. If we say rotate 45 degrees again on the y-axis, it's going to rotate 45 degrees. Now, the big thing to realize is that the x, y, and z-axis never change. If I rotate to look 45 degrees to the right, okay, Technically, my x and y axis and z axis are all still the same. So if I say rotate y again, it's going to do the same thing. But if I say rotate on the x axis, we aren't going to rotate based on where we're looking. The x axis is still right here. So if I rotate 45 degrees on the x axis, normally I go like this, okay? But if we're rotated this way and we say rotate 45 degrees, what happens? 
well, it's actually going to break. So let's go ahead and we'll rotate approximately 45 degrees here. You can still see that we're at an angle now. But if I say rotate 45 degrees on the x-axis, what happens? Notice that the entire angle, if we rotate down 45 degrees or up 45 degrees, that's not right. We're looking at a side view, and yet we're rotating like we're still looking in that other direction, like we're looking at zero. If we turn around this way, it breaks. So, okay, well, wait a sec. What if we do it like this? We look up, okay, so we're looking up now, then we rotate. Well, that's more normal. That's ex exactly what we would expect from a first-person shooter uh, viewpoint. Okay trying to make sure we can see that. So, you know, now it's things are getting really, really messy because we're adding all of those rotations onto each other. And this is where things get really tricky. So how can we go ahead and make sure that our rotations all work out perfectly? Well, the basic way to do so is we need to remember that there's an order to all of these rotations. So if you notice, in this case, we aren't really going to be ever rotating along the z-axis because it's a first-person shooter. You don't really ever look like this or like this. When we get to the virtual reality side, we will need to account for that, and it's pretty simple to fix, but for right now, we do not need our uh, z-rotation. So what do we need to do? Well, a very quick and easy way is that we can re realize that our... Uh, so if we go ahead and we restart this, if we look up or down first and then rotate, everything comes out fine. You can see now that even when I rotate around, okay, I'm doing my best to keep everything in view so you can kind of see, you know, even as we rotate a full 90 degrees, that rotation is still correct, that viewpoint. So it's only when we rotate on the x-axis, on the y-axis first, and then try and rotate that things break. So uh, the reason for that is that there's a very specific order to how you add increment all of the rotations. So a very, very easy fix for this as a result is if we come over here of our camera, what we're going to do is we're going to add in a VEC3. Um, and in order to do that, we need to include one other library. Let me go ahead and grab that. I'm surprised we are not already having that. Um, so we go ahead and we grab this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we take in, we're going to need a VEC3. That is going to come from leave here. So we take in this VEC3. Right? Oh, where is VEC3 defined? I can never remember on this. Sorry guys, I thought we already had this figured out. There it is. Okay. So there's our VEC3. Should have been in there. Okay, let's go over to Shader. Sorry guys, project's a little different, so I thought I already had this. Shader, Shader, C++. There it is. I should have it. No? Okay. Where is VEC3 defined? I could have sworn it was in there. Just bring this up and we'll look for the exact source code. Okay, VEC3 is defined in type VEC. Okay, why is that not coming up as easily? Okay. I guess that does not want to play nicely. Okay, anyways, let's continue on. VEC3 rotation. I am getting way too many notifications from Steam, so I'm going to go ahead and close out of Steam. Okay, there we go. Oh, and actually, I know what happened. Oh, sorry guys, it's been one of those days. We forgot to do colon, colon, back three. There we go. Rotation. Okay, so we're going to be more specific and name this cam rotation. Oh, I have that all situated. So uh, VEC3, if you remember correctly, is just a, a three-dimensional vector that knows what the rotations are for these. And it's pretty straightforward what we're going to do. We're going to come over now back to our test state. And rather than updating for each one of those that rotational value, what we're going to do is we're going to do this, rot camera rotation dot y 
And in this case, we're going left, so we're going to go and do plus equals 1. And we're going to rotate based on that. Then we're going to do the same thing here. Cam rotation uh, dot y minus equals 1. And then we're going to do the same thing for our x-axis now. So we're going to say x plus equals 1, and then x minus equals 1. And that is going to allow us to track the rotations that way. Now that we've gone ahead and done that, though, we need to set the rotations. So you'll remember that I said that our rotation method for our camera over here, there's two methods. There's set rotation, which sets it to whatever we choose, and then we have rotate, which increments it. So what we actually want to do is the first, very first thing we want to do is we want to take our camera, and we want to set the rotation to be 0, 1, 1, 1. That's basically going to say there's no rotation whatsoever, nothing. Just set straight on, no rotation. Once we do that, then we can go ahead and actually rotate based on where we are. So we're looking at nowhere. Now what we want to do is we want to rotate first along the x-axis. So we do 1, 0, 0. Okay? What that's going to do... Whoops. Ah. There we go. So what that's going to do is it's first going to apply that x rotation, okay? Now that we've done the x rotation, we're now going to want to apply the y rotation, which we're going to then put on the y axis. Now, if we go ahead and we do this, you'll notice that if I go ahead, and once this is loaded up, so we apply that x rotation first, and then it rotates fine. So now we can actually go ahead and do this. Now you'll notice that our actual camera movement is still long. The reason why is, again, remember, when we rotate, okay, if we rotate 45 degrees to the right, our x-axis and our y-axis are still the same because we're rotating the world around it. And so this doesn't actually rotate the axis along which the rotations occur. We're rotating the objects, not the actual physical open GL space. So now that we've got our basic rotations, um, and again, we're going to map this to the mouse in just a bit. Right now it's just stuck with the arrow keys. But for the time being, this works. Um, and you can see that even if I go all the way around, the rotations are still applied correctly. Okay, so that's our basic rotations uh, with the keyboard. So let's go ahead now and make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Let's go ahead and apply these rotations along to our camera's movement. Now this is actually pretty straightforward. It's actually not that crazy. Um, but what we're going to do to kind of get this all set up properly, we're also going to now create a GLM VEC3 speed. Um, and actually, this should be velocity. Yeah, velocity. So this is going to be our camera's velocity of how fast it can move. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up here after we create our camera. So we create our shader, we create our camera, our test shape, we create our camera, and then we need to go ahead and set the velocity equal to uh, vec TLM vec three, and then we're going to set it to one. Uh, 0. Point, I think I set it to 1, 0 0.1f, 0 0.1f. And this is going to allow us to have variable speed, and all we'll have to do is come up here and change this. So we want to move faster, we increase it slower, decrease, so on and so forth. So these car alarm is going off. Okay, so the first button we have here, and I'm going to actually do this out of order. So we have uh, up, left, right, up, and down. So we're going to start with the forward and backward movement, which is uh, W and S keys. So when we're moving forward, and this is where it gets kind of tricky. So remember that I said that when we are moving forward, okay, so when we start moving forward, our rotation is zero. We haven't rotated at all. Um, so this, if uh, my hand right now, is this hand is going to be where the camera is facing. This arm is the Z axis, okay? So if our character is facing forward, when we push the forward key, okay, so there's no rotation on the Y axis. We, we're pointing forward. We want to move forward, so we're going to move along the Z axis, okay? Now, let's imagine that we rotate 90 degrees to the right, so our character is facing this way, okay? So when he pushes the forward key, he actually doesn't move at all along the z-axis, he now moves along the x-axis. So what we need to do is, based on the rotation, we need to go through and change which directions it works. Now, you might think, oh, well, we have to do all these weird if statements and stuff and all of that. Well, no. This is the great part about all the math behind this is that 
we actually have mathematical functions that automatically handle this for us. We can use a combination of cosine and sine in order to change the direction based on what it is. So for those of you who remember in math class, um, a cosine is going to be 1 when the value put into it is 90 degrees, or pi over 2. Um, the reason I say pi over 2 is that's radians, and radians is going to be what we need to use. But for simplicity's sake, and so we're not getting into all this crazy stuff, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just stick with um, degrees. So let's go ahead and write this out a little bit so that'll be a little bit easier to see. And that is, so for cosine, okay, the important things to realize is that when cosine is 0, that's going to give us a result of 1. Okay, so when there's no rotation, we automatically move in that direction. If we have a cosine of 90, okay, correct, 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 yes. If we have a cosine of 90 degrees, sorry, my math's a little rusty on here. Um, if we have a cosine of 90 degrees, however, that gives us a result of 0. Okay, so if we have a cosine of 180 degrees, okay, so that's basically we've rotated backwards. What does that give us? It gives us negative 1. That's the exact value we want in one instance. We'll go over that in a sec. But if we have the cosine of 270, okay, so that is the opposite of this 90 degrees effectively, then we get a value of 0 again, okay? And then once we get to 360, we're technically back at 0, and so we start again at 1. And these will interpolate between each other as well. So uh, a value between uh, negative 1 and 1 will be given uh, for, or a value between 1 and 0 will be given for 45 degrees, um, and so on and so forth. So that's how cosine works. For sine, it's very similar, except a sine of 0 degrees is now 0. Okay, so if we have no rotation, sine gives out 0. If we give sine of 90 degrees, however, that gives us 1. And say, and then so on and so forth, you can probably already see the pattern. Sine of 180 would be 0, and a sine of 270, which is the opposite of 90, is going to be equal to negative 1. Correct? Correct. I think that's right. And a quick way, if you guys are not sure of the different... Um, graphs and such, what you can actually do is you can go over to Google and you can go sine wave. And that should go ahead and give you a nice pretty picture from Wikipedia. So that is our sine wave. So we start at 0, we get to 90 degrees, we go to 1, we go back to 180 degrees, that's 0, we go to 270, that's negative 1, and then we go back to our 360 degrees or uh, zero again, and we get zero, and then starts over and it repeats. Same for cosine wave. Oops, that should be wave. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Cosine wave. If we go ahead and we type that, then we will get the cosine wave, which, why is that not? Uh, where's the Wikipedia article? So that's going to be a lot easier to see. Oh, joy. Oh, do, cosine. There it is. Cool. There's the picture. Uh, they don't have a nice picture for cosine? Okay. This is one of the downsides. Okay, here we go. That'll work. And cosine is the different in that if we have a cosine of 0, it starts at 1. Cosine of 90 degrees gives us 0. Cosine of 180 degrees gives us negative 1, and then we repeat again. So that's kind of the difference between the two. So, now that we have that figured out, how can we apply that to our movement? This is the key part. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So we have all our math figured out. What does this mean? Well, that means that when we are facing forward, remember what I said that when we're facing forward, okay, so we have our uh, z-axis and we're facing forward, okay, what we want to do is we have a rotation on the y-axis. The only axis we're focused on is the y-axis, okay? That's all we're going to worry about because that's all first-person shooter really needs to move along. It only needs to move along that to start, okay? We're ignoring collisions and all of that for right now. When the player presses a key, they're going to be moving along the x-axis and the z-axis. That's it. So, when the rotation is zero, okay, so we have our uh, z-axis and we have our character, okay? Z-axis, character. Character's rotation is zero, which means that we want to move along the z-axis 
constantly. We never want to move along the x-axis, okay? So what about when we rotate the character 45 degrees to the right, okay? Now we're still partially moving along the x-axis, so we still want to have a value along the x-axis, but we also want to move, or along the z-axis, but we also want to move along the x-axis. What about when we rotate 45 degrees more? We're at 90 degrees to the right now. Now we don't want to move along the z-axis. We only want to move along the x. So the basic way to think about this is that at zero degrees, okay, with our character along the z-axis, okay, we want to move forward when x is zero, or when the rotation is zero, okay? So when the rotation is zero, we move forward. So that should be one, okay? That's the best way to think about it. When we move 45 degrees to the right, we want to move half as much. When we rotate 90 degrees, we don't want to move along the z-axis at all. And you can already see which one fits that, cosine. So the first thing we're going to do is on our z-axis here, we're going to take our new uh, cam velocity, okay? And this is going to be z times the cosine of cam rotation dot x, or dot y, okay? So we're going to get the cosine of that rotation, and we're going to move it along that. So now that we've gone ahead and done that, I'm going to go ahead and scoot this over a bit so we can see this better. So now that we've gone ahead and did that, what that's going to say is that when we have no rotation, we're going to go ahead and go forward. When we have some rotation, we're then going to uh, go ahead and move differently. Okay, so what about when we have, let me make sure that the chat is okay. Okay, sorry about that. Just wanted to see what was going on in some of the other chats. So. Okay, so that will go ahead and move us forward. What about left and right? Because again, we said that when we're facing forward, okay, we want to move nothing along the x-axis. 45 degrees, we want to move partially, and 90 degrees, we want to move perfectly along the x-axis. Well, a quick look at this shows that that should be, of course, sine, because sine will be nothing along the x-axis when we're at zero degrees, and at 90 degrees, it'll only move along the x. So again, this is going to be the same thing. We're going to do this cam velocity dot x times the sine of this cam rotation dot y. And we're going to go ahead and separate these on these separate lines so that they're more readable as well. Um, and so what this is going to do is this is going to make it so that when we only move along there. Now the thing to remember as well is that this should also be negative because again we're moving opposite of everything. So we have all of that. Um, so what this is going to do now is this is going to make it, and if we go ahead and we run this, you're going to notice something really, really strange. And I'll go ahead and I'll show you what. So right now if we move forward, you still got the normal forward rotation. If we move slightly this way, however, we're now moving in the wrong direction. If we move slightly this way, you'll notice that the, the rotations just don't look right. I mean, the movements forward do not look right. I mean, it's not right at all. So why is this? The problem is, is that these sine and cosine methods expect this to be in radians, not degrees. So what we want to do is we want to call GLM radians, and we want to rotate like that. So we'll go ahead and we'll do that, and we'll do the same thing here. And now, if we go ahead and we run this, you will see that again, everything seems to be working better. And now we have this ability to go ahead and do these rotations perfectly, okay? Now if we go ahead and we go forward, we rotate all the way around. We rotate back, we can now move in that direction. So we've got our forward movement, right? What about our backwards movement? Well, this is pretty straightforward. We just take off the negative to this velocity here, and we will now move in the opposite direction of where we were facing. So now we can rotate this way, we can move backwards relative to it, forward, so on and so forth. Now our x and uh, our left and right rotations along the x-axis, or translations along the x-axis, are still wrong. So how do we fix that? This is actually pretty simple as well. Uh, strafing, all we're going to do now is it's the same exact ordeal except it's flipped. So remember, originally with our y rotation, what we wanted to do is we only wanted when we press the forward key, we want to go forward. When we push it, we want to go back. In this case, if we want to go to the left, which is our A key, what we're going to do now is we're going to flip where we use our sine and cosine. So now, if we're facing forward and we push the A key, which is going to go left, we want zero to actually translate us to the left. 
And so what this means is we now need to have this be a cosine because our x-axis should be moved and our z-axis should only be moved when rotated. So if we go ahead and we run this, I believe it should work, but I might have the rotations wrong, uh, the values wrong. Nope. Okay, so that works. And then we're going to do the exact same thing for our uh, right key, except we're going to take off the negatives. So now, if we go ahead and we do this, we can now rotate perfectly around this thing. Now you'll notice real quick that something is not right. We are not rotating in the correct directions. And that is actually because what we really want to do, let me just check this real quick to make sure I'm telling this all right. Cosine, sine. Okay. Ah. We actually do want these to be flipped like that because of the way that the rotations work and such. So now we have this. Oh, never mind, wrong way. Ah, oh, hold on. Okay, let me just double check how this is rotating. So, if we go ahead and we do this. Ah, that's what it was. Um, so the reason for this is that the rotations here are a little wonky. These need to be negative, I believe, in order to fix that because the way that it's working is that the rotations are slightly off because of how we did our rotations in the system um, on the camera. And they're a little bit different from how I coded them before. So the reason for this is that our rotation to the right is technically rotating the world to the left, and so when we do these movements, we need to account for that. Um, and so that's why this is the way it is. So you can see now that we've got this all situated. Um, the way that you can tell, just so everybody knows how to debug this issue, issue in the future, um, it's a very quick and easy thing to debug if you see this, but what you'll notice is when you rotate, um, you don't move in the proper direction. So like right now, we should actually be moving to the right still, but we're moving more to the left. Um, and it's kind of hard to see, but you can really see it when you like hold down the keys and such. So this is why these need to be negative. Nope. Okay, so let's go ahead now. We've got all that. We've got our basic rotations and our basic movement going on. We can rotate basically straight around. It looks like this is rotating, but we're actually running around in circles at it. And we can you know move perfectly around. Um, now, this is pretty cool and all. But it'd be really, really nice if we could actually do this with our mouse instead of doing it with the keyboard or with the keyboard. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add in rotations for the mouse. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to leave that up there um, so everybody can kind of have that to see in the future. Um, but for now, what we are going to do now, we're going to add in mouse rotation. So this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, it's not that hard. The first thing I want to do, because I know I'll forget to do this, is we want to create a mouse speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a constant uh, float mouse speed is equal to 0.05f. I'm just going to do it that way. No big deal. So mouse speed is going to be defined as how fast when we move our mouse, how fast does the camera rotate. Um, so once we go ahead and we do that, it's all actually pretty straightforward for how we're going to do that. Now, we don't get any of the window information in here, so I'm actually not going to go through and worry too much about how to do that because I don't, I don't feel like passing in the... Uh, the window and all sorts of hecticness for that. Um, if you want to do that, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, let me see, actually. Maybe we'll do that this time. Let me see how much effort that will require. Where is our application? So we have our window here. Eh, guess we could. could do that, but I don't really feel like doing that right now. We'll go over that in future videos. Um, today I really just want to focus on the basics and we can improve on this in the future. So right now we're going to focus on just very, very basics. Um, so the, the straightforward way that this works, we'll do it right under our normal rotation here, is you're basically going to need to get the X uh, position of the mouse and the Y position of the mouse. Once you do that, you're going to call SDD, SDL get global mouse state, okay? And you're going to then pass in the X position and the Y position as reference, as uh, pointers. 
and that's going to go ahead and that's going to get the current mouse position. Next, what we want to do is afterwards, we don't want the mouse to constantly be moving around the screen. We want it to just kind of stay in one spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it to position 500, 500, since this looks pretty nice. Um, and what this is going to do is this is going to get the mouse position and then set it back. And what we want to do now is we want to then apply that rotation to our Y. Uh, so we're going to have the mouse speed. And that's going to be multiplied by 500 uh, by a float. So we're going to convert it to a float after subtracting the five x position from there. And that should be cam rotation. So that's gonna, what that's going to do is that's going to take our camera rotation. It's going to subtract from it. And actually, uh, we want to add to it in this case. Whoops. Um, that's going to add to it the difference between, so we put the mouse at position 500. If we move it to the right, it's going to be 500 minus that times the mouse speed. If we move it to the left, it's going to be positive value now because the mouse position is going to get smaller. And so that's going to end up uh, increasing it in that case. And we're basically going to do that for the Y, and we're going to do the same thing for the X, except instead we're going to now use the Y position. If we're moving up and down, we want to rotate along the X axis. When we're moving left and right, we want to rotate along the Y axis. So if we go ahead and we do that, you'll notice immediately that as soon as I open the game, something weird should happen in theory. Yep, so we can go ahead and we can move our mouse around and everything. Um, and this works, you know, you still get the same uh, positional stuff. But there's something weird to notice, okay? And it's not really prominent right now, but you'll notice right there. Why did nothing show up? The reason is, is that the first thing we're doing is we're getting the mouse position. Then we're setting the position. So if I start my mouse all the way up here and I run this, my mouse is repositioned and the room is rotated right thereafter. So what we need to do is if we take this line right here, this warp mouse global line, we copy that. We can come up here to our initialize function, and right when we set, after we set up the camera, we're going to go ahead and set the mouse position. So now our mouse starts at position 500, 500, and it won't do that weird rotation thing. Okay. Now you'll notice that position 500, 500 is not in the center of the screen. That's because I'm not too worried about it. I'm just kind of putting it somewhere simple. Um, you can, of course, go through. There's actually ways. So you'll notice if we come down here, um, we have warp mouse global. You can actually set it to be in the center of the window instead. I'm not too worried about that right now. Same with the get global mouse state. I'm not too worried about that right now. That's a pretty simple change. You pass in the window. You do it that way. We'll do that in the future. For now, just ignore it. Um, the last thing that I really, really want to do, because I hate seeing the mouse there, it takes away from the game. So what we're going to do is we're going to do show cursor. This is a window-specific uh, function, however, so I don't really want to use that. Uh, so we're going to do SDL show cursor, and then we're going to set that to zero to hide it. Um, if you're in Windows, another way you can do this, this will work in all applications. You can even do this with a console application. You can do show cursor and set that to false. However, that is not uh, acceptable throughout all uh, operating systems. So SDL show cursor is going to be better. So now if we go ahead and we do this, you'll notice that our cursor disappears. And we can rotate everything like we would normally. And we can, of course, still move around. It still takes into our counter rotation because we're just changing that. And it's pretty straightforward. So now we have our mouse. We can go ahead and do that. But one thing you'll notice is that once we go ahead and we rotate around, it's very hard to tell which direction we're facing until we see the quad again. So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to actually create a basic room for which we can play around in. This is going to be very similar, and I'm going to show you real quick what the final result will look like. It's going to be very similar to this psychedelic room that we're in right here. So you'll notice that you can really easily tell where you're moving, even when you're not doing anything. Um, and you can, of course, come outside and see the outside of the room. There's no collisions. It's just a basic uh, rectangular room. It's very straightforward, nothing crazy. So how do we do that? We remember before we have that uh, test shape that we made. So we're now what we're going to do is we're going to come here, add new item, and we're just going to call this a room cube. And all I'm going to do, because I really don't want to rewrite every little thing, we're just going to copy a test shape, and we're going to place it into here. And then we're going to rename this to room cube, and do the same thing there and there. Then what we need to do is come down to source files, add a new item, and this time it's going to be our C++ file, which will be room cube. 
and let's move our headers around just so we have everything nice and organized. And then we're going to go ahead and over here open up our room, our uh, test sheet. And we're just going to copy paste this over again. The final thing we need to do is we need to take this room cube, we need to rename everything appropriately. And that will go ahead and give us our basic setup. So now that we've got that, the final thing we need to do is we need to rename this data because it's already been declared another file. That's going to give us a nice error. So we're going to do room vertices and we're going to do room elements. And this is as simple as coming into here and replacing them below. Okay, so this is our basic room, but all it's set up for right now is it's just going to look like another quad. Um, so what we want to do is we want to actually make a more complicated 3D shape. The basic way to remember is that if we have a cube, which I'm going to demonstrate with a leap motion box. So we have this cube here. Let me make sure I can see this. So we have this cube. Um, you'll notice that it's got multiple sides. There are a total of six sides to this. So we need to create a couple of them. We need to create a front. We need to create a back. We need to create the left side. We need to create the right side. We need to create a top and a bottom for a floor and ceiling. Now, uh, thanks to the way that this is set up, we actually already have a pretty good starting point. What we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to space these out real quick. So we have on the left side, we have our uh, vertices positions. So we'll go ahead and do vertices, and then over here we have our colors. Okay, and I'm going to rename this actually to say positions. So we have our positions and our colors. So right now our positions are set up so that there's just two positions. Because with quad we don't need all the 3D depth data. So what we actually want to do is we want to go through now and we want to add in one extra value which is our Z position. So we go through, we do that, and we get this nice little uh, setup. So we're going to do that, that, and that. So now each component has three sections to it. Now to account for this, we have to come down here to our vertex attribute pointer. We're going to change this to a three because there's now three elements in each position attribute because we've got the X, the Y, and the Z. Next, we're going to come over to the right side a little bit more. You, in this case, we've gone from having five elements, two position, three color, to three position and three color. So we actually have six elements total be between each new data point. Finally, our position color attribute, originally there were only two vertices behind, in front of it. Now we have three because we have the X, Y, and Z. So now that we've got all of that situated, there's one more thing we need to do to make this usable, which is we need to come over to our vertex shader. Because originally, since we only had those two, we didn't worry about passing in any, uh, we set the default to zero. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of that zero. That's going to take in, and we're going to change in this to a VEC3. Um, now all of this is already handled automatically. Um, there's not a whole lot more you have to do. The final thing is that originally we only had 20 uh, vertices. Now we have six per line, four lines, so we actually have 24 now. Okay, So we need to adjust that. So now that we've got all this situated, um, we're all set to go. Um, the final big thing that needs to be done is we need to actually, and we don't need to do this, it'll still technically work. It's good practice to get into. But remember, this shader is being applied for our room cube. We just updated it so that it takes in a VEC3 for the positions. However, we also need to now update that because we need to have the positions of the um, other shape, our test shape, match up to that. Now, I'm not going to worry about that. It's going to still show up correctly, but you, it's a good habit to get into. So we've got all of this set up now. We've got our uh, updates here. Now we need to go and add more data. So to get more specific, this is going to be our front section. So each of these are for the front face of the cube. Okay, so we have our positions and colors for the front face of the cube. However, we also need those for the back. So the back is actually pretty straightforward. So for the uh, for the front, what it's going to be is it's going to be negative uh, 10, I think is what I have it set to those. And we're going to go ahead and set those up there um, to be negative 10 on each of those. We do that. And one more. And then the front, the back face, is going to be positive 10. We're going to go ahead and update this as well, the back. So that way we can get a pretty uh, easy view of what exactly each one is. Oops. 
And now the final thing I'm going to do is it's going to be a lot easier for us to understand which one is which if we go ahead and we label these. So this is uh, data point 0, this is data point 1, this is vertice 1, vertice 2, vertice 3, vertice 4, vertice 5, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a sec, vertice 6 and vertice 7. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and we want to form the cube. So the basic way to think about this, okay, we've already got our front face defined right here, okay? This is going to be the face right along here, okay? Now on the back side right here, there's another face, okay, that's backwards. So the way that we actually create this is we want to create two triangles, okay? So if you'll remember, we talked uh, last a uh, couple times ago now that we split this into triangles. This face right here, okay, this quad for this side of the sh box, is made up of triangles, okay? I'm going to flip it over to this side so you can see more easily. So we have a point here that makes up the first part of the triangle. We have the right side, which is the next point, and then we have the bottom right. So our first triangle looks like this, okay? So that's our first triangle. Our second triangle starts from here, and then it has this point, and then it has this point. So our second triangle, oops, sorry, one there, there, and because I said this is the first point, second, third, okay, this is our next point, this one, and this one. So we have one triangle that looks like this, and we have our next triangle looks like this, okay? So there are two halves to that side. So we need to do that for both the front face and the back face, or sorry, front face and back face. So all we have to do in this case, we've already got those next set of coordinates right here. So all we have to do now is we take 4, which is that 4 right here, okay? Then we take 5, which is the line below it, and then 6. So that's the first half of the triangle. So the next half of that triangle starts with 6, then we go on to 7, and then we loop back to go to 4, okay? And we need to make sure we have a column there. So that is our next triangle. So that is our front and back face. Now we need to do left and right. And this is where the things get tricky. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, so I'm going to try and explain as best I can. But um, it might be a little confusing. If you have questions about this, please feel free to leave it in the comments. If I can find a diagram for it, I will, but it's a little tricky. Um, so that's our front face, back face on the top. The next one we want to do is we want to do the left side. Okay. So the left side is made up of points from both the front face and the back face. We have these two right here in the front, and then on the back we have this one, and this two, one, okay? So what we want to do is we want to start out, again, we're going to start with the bot top left corner, then to the right, then bottom right, okay? So in this case, okay, we have the back, so in this case, if I'm looking at it, we're going to have the back top left, okay? And we can see already that that lines up with 4 from right there. So we've already got that, okay? The next one we want is we want the front top left, okay? Now you'll see that the top left front aligns with 0, okay? Now that we have the front top left, we want to get the front bottom left, okay? Now this is where it gets tricky. The front bottom left is actually 3. So now we're going to go ahead and change that to be a 3, okay? So we have that first triangle, 1, 2, 3, so we have that first half. Now we need to make this triangle here, which is going to be these three points right here, if you can see. Um, so we have these three points. What we're going to want to do then, okay, so we have this front face. So now what we want to do is we want to take the bottom front left again, okay? So the bottom front left, again, is 3. We've already used that one. Now that we've done the bottom front left, we want to do the back, uh, the bottom left back. So the bottom left back is 7. So our next point is going to be this 7 here, which we already have. Now that we have the bottom back left, we want to go back to our origin point, which in this case is 4, because our 4 is our top left back point. So we've already got that set. And what we're going to do now, so we, in this case, what we should have is we should have our front wall, which is these six, our back wall, which is these six, and then our uh, left wall, which is these six. So we need to go ahead and adjust some stuff. First off, you'll notice that we no longer have six elements. We actually have 18 elements. So we need to adjust this value here. And 
After we've adjusted that, that's actually it. We now know how many elements are there. So once we've gone ahead and done that, the next step of what we need to do is we need to come over to our test state, our test state, and we're now going to go ahead and add in uh, some other stuff. So the first thing we need to do is we need to include our test, our room cube. So we include our room cube, and then we're going to create a pointer to one of those objects. Then we're going to come over to our test state, and right under where we initialize our test state shape, we're going to do initialize the room, which is equal to new room cube, and we're going to pass in our shader. Finally, we're going to come down here, and we're going to draw that room. So we go ahead and we get this started, and this is going to look weird for a warning, okay? Uh-oh, what happened? What's going on here? What, first off, the shaping is wrong. Second of all, our room does not look correct at all. It just it doesn't look right. And this is where things get a little tricky. So um, first off, as far as the shape of the room, we have to remember now that first off, we forgot to update something. We no longer have just 24 vertices. We actually have 48 total. So we need to go through and update this. So we go ahead and we update that. Let's run it again, see what goes on. So now we have our left room, we have our back wall, but we don't seem to have, and we have our front wall, okay? So we have each of those, but you'll notice it's really small. And the reason for this is that while we set up our uh, room length, okay, the Z axis to be very long, we didn't set up the, y, the X axis. So we need to go through again. We need to update this, okay? This is another thing that can throw you off, is remember, each of these define the points that make up these shapes. So if we go ahead and we do this, okay? Now you'll notice that the room is much, much larger. I mean, it's huge in comparison now, okay? Much, much bigger. There's something wrong still. If you look at this shape right in the center, you'll notice that the outline of the shape is just not right. There's, you can see the wall through that, okay? And this is, this is important, okay? And it, this is very, very important. You might go through and you might code this, and if you switch these around, if you draw them in a different order, okay? first thing you will notice if you go through and you do this is that everything is correct okay the reason for this is that OpenGL draws things in that order okay so right now if we draw our room first we draw the room and then we draw the test shape so when we do that the order of things is we draw the room first on the image on our buffer okay so what the window displays Okay, remember I said that when we tell OpenGL to draw stuff, it draws in the order we give it. So we draw the room, and then we draw the, the quad, or test shape, on top of it. So if we switch these like we had originally, now what's going on is it draws the test shape first, and then it draws the room. So in this case, the room and the test shape intersect each other, okay? They're displayed on top of each other, and so what ends up happening is that it, um, it basically goes ahead and it affects it because now what's going on is we're erasing the pixels that we drew the shape onto with the room, okay? So there's actually a pretty easy fix for this. Um, it's very, very, very simple. Um, and this is what we're going to do for now. In the future, we'll do some more advanced stuff. Um, that'll kind of make this a little bit different. But if we come over to our application, we need to add a new thing. So we go through, we initialize glue, and we get an OK message back, okay? So we do that. What we need to do now is we need to enable what's called a uh, depth test, okay? Depth test. What this does is this goes through and says, okay, you need to tell me which objects are closer or further from my camera. And OpenGL automatically handles the entire thing. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's see what happens. So there's more, more to it than just this. But if we go ahead and we run this, everything's gone. Every single thing is gone from our image. No matter where we rotate, no matter where we move, everything is gone. The reason for this is, again, if we come over to our test state, we have this color buffer, okay? What OpenGL does is it also creates a depth buffer. So when you draw everything, it creates a depth buffer and automatically goes through and compares how far away those objects are. And then based on how far away they are, it decides on what objects to draw first. However, we also need to make sure that once we're done uh, with that, we need to go ahead and clear the depth buffer as well as the color buffer. So we need to clear the color data for what the image actually shows. And behind the scenes, OpenGL is a depth buffer, what we also need to clear. So now, if we go ahead and we do that, 
when we run this again, you'll notice everything shows up fine. All of our uh, depth objects are fine. And no matter which order we show these in, it will still go through and draw them perfectly fine. So now the order of which way we draw them doesn't actually matter, and we can go through and we can actually uh, move around. All of our depth is fine. Uh, all of our objects are visible. You can see that the room is moving perfectly fine. Um, and yeah. So now let's go ahead and for our final phase, let's go ahead and finish off this room cube. So we've already gone ahead, let's line these back up. Uh, we've already gone ahead and gotten our various uh, we got our, our left wall. Now we need to do our right wall, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll label each one of these as wall. Front wall, back wall, and we have left wall, okay? Excuse me. Now what we need to do is we need to create a right wall. So we'll go ahead and we'll label that. Um, and what we're going to do now, I'm going to shrink this down a little bit so we can see this a bit better. Um, so where is the box? Here it is. Okay. So we've done our front wall, we've done our back wall, we've done our left wall. Now we need to do our right wall. So our right wall is going to be made up of the same types of vertices. So what we're going to do is we're going to start again. We're going to start from uh, top left, right, down, across. Okay. So the first point in this case is actually going to be the top right of the front. Okay. So we have top right, front right here. So our first value is going to be one. Then we're going to go back. So we're going to have the top right of the back, which in this case is going to be a five. So our next value is going to be five. Now that we have that, we want to go down one. So it's going to be back, right, bottom which in this case is going to be a six. Oops. So now that we have our six, now what we want to do is we want to take that six again. This time now, we've, so we've got our six here. Okay, so we got one, two, three, six right here. Okay, now we want to come forward. So we want to get the front bottom right, which in this case is going to be two. Finally, we're going to reconnect it up at the top with our top right front, which is one. Okay, so that's our right wall gone ahead and created. Now what we want to do is we want to do the floors and ceilings. Okay, so let's go ahead and label this. Oh, I hate this. Somebody called my name on IRC and my client likes to take control and freeze altogether. It's terrible. is we're going to have our ceiling and we're then going to have our floor. Um, so now that we have this, we're going to do our ceiling and our floor. So our ceiling is going to start again. We're going to have our triangle start from top left, top right, and then bottom right, bottom left. So we're going to start here, which is going to be our back top left. So in this case, it's going to start with a four. So we're already fine there. Then we're going to do our top right back, which is in this case going to be a five. Finally, we're going to go to our front top right, which is the final one, which is going to be front top right is right here, which is a one, okay? So now we're gonna start out with that one again, and our next point is gonna be right here. Okay, so this is our top left, the top left front, which is zero. Finally, we're going to go back to our back top left, which is a four again. So that's going to be our ceiling. Finally, now that we're almost done with this, I apologize it's taking so long to go through this. So we have our ceiling, and we can go ahead and we can run this. We're going to ignore the floor for now. Um, we're going to have these last six. So we have 6, 12, 18, 24, 30 points total. So we need to update our room elements to reflect that. Now if we go ahead and we run this, what we'll have to do is we will have our basics. Now the one thing to notice is our ceiling doesn't look right. If we look all the way up, something doesn't seem right. We're seeing red. 
there's a reason for this, okay? And this is something that I kind of talked about briefly, but I didn't really cover properly, and I apologize for that. If we come over to our camera C++ file, and we go up to where we actually get the perspective view, um, you'll notice that our distance for how far away we can see stuff is set to 1,000. But our near distance is set to 1, and our ceiling's height is like half. It's like 0.5. So we actually need to adjust this to be a little bit smaller. I usually like to set it really low, but I'm just going to set it to 0.01f, which is more than enough. So now, even though we're pretty close to the ceiling, we're actually not going to see outside of it. So the floor still isn't finished, but we've got the walls, we've got the ceiling. So let's go ahead and we'll finish up the floor now. So this is our last one. We're nearly there now. So our floor. So let's go ahead and we'll paste that in, erase that last comma. So we have our floor. Okay. So our floor is now going to start with top left, one, two, three, four. Okay. So to start with, we have our um, we have our back, top, left. And actually, hold on a second, I want to think this through. So actually, we don't want to start this way. And there's a reason why I'm not going to go into it, though. We're going to do it the way I was going to do it. We'll go over that when we get to texturing. So for the time being, we're going to look at it like this manner, okay? So our floor, we're looking at it from the bottom up. Okay, so we're going to start out with our back, bottom left. Our back bottom left, if we come up here, we have back bottom left, which is 7. Okay, so our first point here is 7. Then we're going to move over to our back bottom right, which is going to be a 6. Finally, we're going to be front bottom right, which is our last value, and our front bottom right, if we look up here, is a 2. Okay, so now we start with that 2 again. This time we want to go to front, bottom, left. Front, bottom, left is a 3, so we're going to set that. Finally, we're going to go back to our bottom left back, which is going to be a 7 again. So we're going to go ahead and we'll run this one more time, and you will finally see that we have a floor all set. Oops, did I do something wrong? Oh, yeah. Finally, don't forget, this is something that drive you nuts, and we'll optimize this in the future so it does it for us. But we need to add on these last six points to our list of room elements. So we're going to add in now for that to be 36. So we go ahead and we run that, and that will finally draw our floor. Okay. Now you'll notice that the floor colors and the ceilings and all of that kind of blend together. The reason for this is because we're actually using a single list of elements and all of those vertices share the colors. Now um, we'll go again, all of this we're gonna go into this over the future we're gonna go over this in the future. But the way that you would handle that is you might end up having uh, two arrays, one for positions, one for colors, and then your colors will have a variety of different ones. So you can have uh, the colors match up differently to the actual room elements. Um, Right now, we're not going to really worry about that. It, it's just not really worth it. Um, there's all sorts of tricks you could do for it. Really, what we're going to end up doing is texturing the whole thing anyway, so there's not a whole need to, but you can use the material in this to do so. So this is our basic first-person shooter so far. Um, we have a basic room. We have camera movement. We have mouse movement. We've hidden the mouse. We've locked it to the window. Um, and we're going to improve all of this in the future. The basic goal of this is to go over all of the core information you need. So we have a little cube room that we can go through and do some stuff with. Um, the big thing we're going to go over next time is we're going to go over texturing. Um, texturing is quite the topic in and of itself. Um, it's going to take some time to go over. Um, um, and yeah, that's basically it for today's tutorial. Uh, we've gone over camera rotations. We've gone over a very basic room. Um, any other questions going on in the chat? Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here last weekend. Uh, my girlfriend and I went to Disney to celebrate our anniversary. Uh, so that was a great time. But unfortunately, I wasn't at my desktop to stream. But so far, so far, good. It looks like we're, I'm going to be here for the rest of this month and everything. So hopefully no more interruptions. Um, maybe one weekend of traveling, but that would be it. Um, so I hope you guys are enjoying these. Um, one other quick thing, I am planning to do another game development contest. Uh, last year we did code a, I did Code a Game, which was a nice little game development jam. Um, there's a little bit of talk about it though because uh, I, I was kind of trying to force people to use normal programming methods. This year I think we're going to allow Unity and Unreal and all the other stuff. Um, so I'm still working on it, but 
hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, again, hopefully this is this will be something you guys can do as well as setting up with OpenGL and using the tools that we have uh, created to go through and create your own games as well. Um, and the other thing is I've heard a lot of people curious about uh, doing other games in SDL such as Pong and such. Um, I might do those in the future. I'm actually thinking of maybe doing some quick games with this, so like a third-person shooter, a first-person shooter, a 2D game using OpenGL and SDL and some other stuff. Um, but that would come further down the pipeline. I really want to focus on the basics of 3D. How do you create movement? How do you create um, all of these different things? Um, you know, how do you get different matrices and stuff like that? How you do views, texturing? Um, we'll probably get into some neat little special effects like lighting and such obviously, and then maybe some more advanced stuff. I'd love to maybe cover lens flare. I'd have to take a look into some of the you know techniques for that, but it'd be neat to try and do that. Um, maybe we'll do something like real-time shadowing. Um, we're definitely going to be doing virtual reality support with this. That'll be really fun soon, but this is going to be a much longer series. Um, we're probably going to be going well into June, maybe even July with this, so there's going to be plenty of content. Uh, for those who kind of tuned in on the later half, all of these go on YouTube afterwards. Um, I'm going to be updating all of the links below today as I add the new videos. There's an entire playlist for Season 2, which is going on right now. Uh, season 1 is also up there, which uses SFML with C++ to do 2D stuff. So if you feel a little overwhelmed by this, you know, maybe you're not new to C++, the 2D games and stuff can be a little bit better. Um, created a whole bunch of stuff, but I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. Um, please let me know in the comments below on YouTube if you have questions. I try to get to them as often as I can. Sometimes I have to do them all in one day just because of schedules. Um, and again, feel free to tune in. This will be every Saturday, 3 p.m. It'll usually be between 3 and 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time Standard. Uh, that is, what, noon and 1 o'clock uh, uh, Pacific Standard Time, and then uh, 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, Global Time, so GMT. So thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you guys have enjoyed these videos. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying them and learning a lot. I hope you guys feel like these are much better prepared than in the past and that they don't feel as crazy. I know I'm still rushing through a lot of stuff, but I'm trying to just cover a ton of stuff with you guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, hopefully I will see you next time. Uh, yeah, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you, again, if you missed stuff, it'll be all be on YouTube, so feel free to tune in. If you're coming in from YouTube, leave any comments, uh, feedback and such in the, in the comments below. See you guys later.